Hello, hello to everyone. I think everyone uh, understands this at this point for Zoom, but it, everyone's choosing uh, to speak to in the chat to everyone. Um, there's also the, the option to message just the host and panelists if you have any uh, technical concerns. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a very jam-packed hour to look forward to. So hello and welcome to this first session of our Health Center Preparedness and Response Forum. Um, we are focused today on infectious and vector-borne diseases. We'll talk momentarily about the full series since this is the kickoff session, um, but we're happy that you're here. Thank you again for introducing yourselves in the chat. We'll go ahead to the next slide. Uh, just very briefly, uh, today your facilitators through this session are myself. My name is Arielle Mather. I'm the program manager of the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders. I'm joined by my colleague, Bob Burns, who's the director of the National Center for Health and Public Housing. He'll be helping to introduce our panelists and close out this session. Just some housekeeping, we all are very familiar with Zoom at this point, but just to note that all participants are muted to prevent background noise, but that does not mean we don't want to hear from you. So please do continue to use the chat box, use the Q&A feature to ask questions during the session. We have three fantastic panelists, so it is going to be very fast and furious through this hour. So we're going to be collecting your questions, organizing them. We're gonna to try to get to as many as possible. Um, so please do use those features to ask questions and we'll get to as many as we can. For those who might be wondering, um, yes, the session is recorded. We are going to send out materials, including a slide deck PDF, um, a transcript of the session itself, and within the next week or two of uh, session recording, that will be closed captioned. So you'll get all of that information via email. All of the registrants for this forum um, will be receiving that within the next week. So please do take a moment at the end of the session to give us your feedback. A Zoom survey will pop up and that will really allow us to better shape the next sessions of this forum and any other learning opportunities um, on this topic. Wonderful. So this is a quick glance of all of the organizations, um, HRSA funded national training and technical assistance partners who have worked on putting this series together. We are not the only NTOPS funded by HRSA. There is a sure. link um, that Kara just put in the chat if you'd like to learn more about the NTOP program and all the various organizations um, that do this work for health centers across the country. But our group in particular um, are focused on unique uh, priority patient populations. And we'll go to the next slide to kind of give you the tiniest bit of context. For this forum, this group originally worked on a specific COVID-19 forum starting in the fall of 2021. This lasted quite a while because there was so much evolving information through the pandemic. So we wanted a space for health centers to share, to get support, to get BIPIC updates. Um, and that was really successful. We really saw just how hard health centers were working to get information and testing and vaccines to their patients. And we were just really blown away by all of your efforts. Um, and when we heard that HRSA would like us to focus on preparedness for emergencies and environmental impacts on health in this next funding cycle that began mid-year this year, we decided to have a new iteration of this type of forum. Um, more generally focused on emergency preparedness and response. You can see that we'll have these four sessions, including today's on infectious and vector-borne diseases. We, we will link the rest of the sessions via the registration page again towards the end of the session, but just know that if you sign up for today, you will get these reminders for the subsequent sessions that will end up being about every other month. All right, so really quickly at a glance, you can see the agenda for today. We have three fantastic speakers. We are going to try to briefly introduce them as we go along. Like I said, please do use the chat box and Q&A to give us your questions. We will try to organize them so each panelist can kind of see um, what your thoughts are and what you might need more information on. And then we will quickly uh, close it up. So we'll go to the next slide because we would love to 
talk a little bit uh, to you as our fantastic audience. We're going to have you utilize Mentimeter. If the, you are not familiar with Mentimeter, um, you can take a look on the screen. You can take a picture of the QR code or type in, I see folks putting in the chat the links to go to. Really easy. Uh, we're just going to ask you a few questions, and I think that getting the visual of your responses will be really informative and hopefully give you a good sense of what others in the room are thinking as well. I see lots of thumbs up, which is fantastic. We'll give it one more second for folks to join. Great. All right, we're going to start with an open-ended word cloud type of question. So this is more general. I know today we're focused on infectious and vector-borne diseases. But because this forum is a more general, you know, we're covering a lot of topics, can you think about for your health center or organization, what are the top emergency preparedness and response priorities? If you could summarize that in maybe not maybe a word or two, three, short phrase, those are going to all start to pop up in, um, in a word cloud. So you'll see as things are coming, things may change size. If there's some agreement, communication I see is communication and hurricane. Thank you everyone for putting things in. We'll kind of watch it for a moment uh, as it grows. And I will say that we'll make the responses to these brief Mentimeter questions available to you afterwards. Cause I think it's a really helpful thing to see what folks are thinking. Wonderful, that was a really quick um, formation of a word cloud. I see we have some in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Lots of lots of things that are priorities. That's fantastic. I wish we could stay for longer. I think we need to go to our next word cloud question. So be ready again to start typing. Um, so we talked about priorities, but that could mean a lot of different things. That could mean it's an area that you're feeling well-versed in or an area that you know you need to put more time and attention to. Um, if we could think specifically about needs or gaps, um, that could be for any type of emergency. We even saw in that first word cloud how there, um, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of what emergency preparedness entails. So I see folks already, Putting in funding is, is a big one. Yeah. Leadership buy-in. Absolutely. Capacity. Yeah. It's so interesting to see. So 40 response. I mean, that's fantastic. You all are on it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, these all seem like very valid needs and gaps, and it can be overwhelming almost to see them all because, you know, we can talk about all these best practices and more information, but we, what do we need? We need leadership buy-in. We need funding. We need capacity. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot that has to be done. So I thank you for reflecting on, you know, considerations that we all need to have in mind when we're talking about these subjects, because, you know, there's a lot of effort, I think that needs to go into filling some of these gaps that you've identified. All right. One more specific question before we turn it over to our panelists. So this is more of a scale question. So if you see that the bottom of the scale is strongly disagree and the top is strongly agree, there's two statements. I'd love for you to drag along uh, the statement, how, how strongly you agree with, with the statement of vector-borne diseases are a priority for my organization, and then if you slash your health center organization are prepared to respond to emerging vector-borne diseases. And you'll see that as we get more responses, the average will uh, continue to change. So I'm seeing a pretty down the middle right now on both. I'm curious as folks are thinking about, you know, it's a little bit subjective. So feel free to put whatever makes the most sense for you. Right down the middle. Interesting. Yeah, you see kind of there's a dip in priority responses. There's a lot on the strongly disagree and there's some that strongly agree. So we get kind of this little average in the middle. 
Okay, great. Um, I'm going to leave it at that, but I hope that we'll be able to continue to do things like this in the beginning of our sessions because it gives us such a great read on where folks are at um, and we'll incorporate that feedback going forward. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Bob, who will introduce us briefly to our first panelist. Oh, you're still on mute, Bob. All right, guys, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Program Office. So this is NOAA's Climate Program Office. Uh, this is Hunter Jones. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of NOAA's Cl Climate and Health Program, and he leads the National Integrated Heat Health Information System as its program manager. He's the vice chair of the American Meteorological Society's Board on Environment and Health, as well as a founding member of the Global uh, Heat Health Information Network. Um, he, and more than that, he's recently completed an embassy science fellowship focused on improving climate services for dengue forecasting in Costa Rica, South and Central America, and the Caribbean. He manages the climate and health grant program at the, the climate program office focused on applied community-based climate and health research. Um, Hunter, we're really looking forward to you kind of setting the stage and beginning with uh, an introduction on what's going on in climate change and how it in impacts infectious and vector-borne disease. Hunter, take it away. Thank you very much. It's good to be here with everybody. Um, so you heard a lot about heat in my introduction. I do focus a lot on heat, but the other uh, priority for me is vector-borne disease. Uh, so I'm thrilled to see that heat will be one of the, the focal areas in a, in a future talk as well. Um, to kind of deliver on the first request on um, what's happening with the climate system. I think we're all experiencing it right now when we get exposed to it quite a lot in the news. So I'll just, uh, I have slides on that kind of thing too, but I'll just share with you the, the one uh, recent fact that August, 2023, the average global surface temperature was the highest for August since global records began in 1850. Uh, unfortunately, we see records like that all the time now that are, that are being broken. Um, if anyone's interested in those kinds of uh, details, this is a really good resource for that. I'm just going to put it right here in the chat for everyone while I'm talking. Um, but that will give you some really good climate background. Uh, and instead, I'm going to focus more on the, the role that climate plays in vector-borne disease for the rest of the talk. So we can go to the next slide. Um, NOAA, you might be wondering, what is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration doing uh, with, with the vector-borne disease uh, talk, and that is uh, really, NOAA has a really broad portfolio. We do a lot of work in um, not only in environmental topics, you, you're familiar with the Weather Service, I'm sure. Um, we have the Ocean Service, we have the, the National uh, Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, we do work with marine mammals, and that means we take a One Health approach. So we, we cut across so many different aspects of extreme heat that we really do have a role to play in vector-borne disease, waterborne disease, air quality, uh, extreme conditions like extreme heat. Uh, and that's why I really enjoy being a health person at NOAA, uh, because there's a really good role for us to play there to work with uh, health users and make sure that the kind of climate data and forecasts that we have are, are useful for health applications. So on the next slide, <clears throat> we can get a little bit into, uh, you know, understanding how NOAA does inform prediction of vector-borne disease. Uh, we can move to the next slide as well. And uh, I want to start with a, a bit of a kind of big picture idea and then go into a quick little case study. So the reason this is important to focus on is because um, something that happened in the U.S. and a lot of uh, a lot of developed countries um, globally is that there has been an epidemiological transition over you know, many centuries. Uh, in the past, it was very common for uh, vector borne and infectious disease to be the primary cause of uh, human mortality. And over time, um, in, in some places that has been overtaken by communicable and infectious uh, neonatal and other deaths. And so the reason for that transmission, the transition, excuse me, is because we've gotten better at hygiene, we've gotten better at um, medical countermeasures, vaccines, things like that. Um, but the challenge that we're facing is uh, global climate change, global mobility, ecological changes are kind of threatening some of that progress because we are um, heating things up, creating more environments, more habitat for vector uh, vector species that vector diseases. Um, global travel is also introducing them to new places. And so what you can see on the right here from the Lancet Countdown, which I believe will be re releasing a new, um, they do it every year. So I believe they'll be releasing a new study pretty soon. They typically do it in this October, November timeframe. Um, you can see the, the climate suitability for the transmission of dengue has been increasing 
uh, over time. And so these are, uh, for two of the mosquitoes that transmit dengue, um, R0 is, is just telling us um, it's the basic reproduction number. So it's the number of, uh, typically it it's means the number of uh, secondary infectious cases that you can have after a primary infection. Um, so it's a good way of getting a, a read on how um, how much that infection is being transmitted. <clears throat> so we are, we are uh, making it a little bit harder on ourselves with all these changes. On the next slide, we'll get a little bit more into the case study. So um, oh, it shrunk a little bit, but I think it's still um, fairly fairly visible. So West Nile virus is uh, is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the continental United States. So it's something that uh, uh, is very strongly of interest to to a lot of us. When it emerged in 1999 in, uh, in kind of the New York City area. Um, there was a lot of speculation about what was going on at first. And so it kind of caught, off, caught us off guard and eventually we figured out what was what was happening. And it was this um, this virus that had existed in other parts of the world for, for many decades, but it finally made its way to the United States. And uh, we had a lot of naive populations of people who could, uh, who could get the, the disease and uh, we had mosquitoes that were suitable for its transmission. So um, we also experienced this recently with, uh, with COVID, of course. So these kinds of things do happen. And uh, that's why this is also important. So even if we we have kind of passed some of these other diseases for now, and we've we found ways to manage them, there are always additional threats on the horizon that we have to be paying attention to. <clears throat> on the next slide, we just can see that that uh, transmission that I was mentioning earlier. So this is getting to the the mobility, migration, ecology, and climate. How that's all coming together. Um, some of the formatting is a little messed up here, but. Uh, you can see how West Nile virus had started in, um, had been first discovered at least in, in Africa and has moved around uh, the world. There are a lot of reasons for this, but human mobility, um, the, the fact that birds also are amplifying hosts for West Nile virus, for example, has probably also contributed to its uh, ability to move around like this. And so this is just a really good example that, uh, you know, what's happening in other parts of the world can happen here as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide. This is uh, sort of uh, just hinted at this already, but this is part of why this challenge exists. So we have this cycle where mosquitoes are the vectors for viruses like West Nile and other other encephalitis uh, oriented diseases like uh, Eastern equine encephalitis and uh, St. Louis encephalitis. Um, and so they they kind of exist in this cycle with birds where they're um, they're taking blood meals from birds. Birds actually uh, when they when they get West Nile virus, uh, they amplify that um, that virus there. They have high viremia. And so that means that they're very good spreaders um, through the vector of this virus. So it's important to understand this cycle and, and why um, mosquitoes and birds and, and other uh, animals are so Im implicated in it because we have to understand um, what their behaviors might be and how those things are influenced by the environment. And that's really, really where our role starts to come in. So if we go to the next slide, um, Mosquitoes being uh, the, the primary um, vector for West Nile virus, the so Culex mosquitoes in the United States, um, it's really helpful to think about all the ways that the environment influences their behavior. So vectors are products of their environments. They are very sensitive to temperature, humidity, precipitation, things like that. And so you can see the life cycle, uh, kind of a standardized life cycle of a mosquito on the left. And you can see all the different behaviors or sort of life um, life moments that, uh, that a mosquito might go through that could be influenced by temperature, precipitation. Um, there are quite a lot of things that uh, that we could be studying and, and using um, our forecasts of temperature to predict. On the right, you can see an example of that. This is coming from um, one of many packages that is available in, in R for anyone who does any statistics. Um, and it's just showing, it's a little bit complicated at first, but it's got temperature and humidity on the axes. And so all those dots are days of the year. And um, this is temperature data from, from Dulles uh, Airport. Just one, I just picked a place to get a, a good temperature record. And um, what the numbers are going around this kind of uh, uh, loop that you see are just uh, kind of a summary of the different months. And so what it's showing us is the vectorial capacity, the ability for, for mosquitoes to transmit disease at different times of the year in different months. And it's just a, it's a demonstration that because mosquitoes are so sensitive to the environment, we can get predictions like this about you know, their ability to transmit disease at different moments. Uh, and that's really helpful and something that we're focused on and we work on with CDC quite a bit. Uh, on the next slide, we can see uh, why this is so important. 
Um, on the left is these kind of spatial distribution of West Nile virus and, and the incidence of West Nile neuroinvasive disease cases. And so you can see there's some spatial um, concentration in the kind of Great Plains and central part of the US, um, as well as uh, the, the week of onset of uh, cases for West Nile virus is, um, you know, kind of peaks in uh, the summer, which would make sense for a vector-borne disease that is mediated by mosquitoes. And on the right, you can see there's a lot of interannual variability. So in the earlier few years, um, as the disease was just kind of getting getting started, there were a lower number of cases, but you can see that there are some spikes there too. And we want to understand these spatial and temporal patterns and why they happen and see if we can predict them so we can give people early warning uh, information to prepare. On the next slide, and I'm moving a little quickly because I know I, we want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and the other fantastic talks. Um, is uh, is one thing that we can predict, which is habitat for mosquitoes. This is coming from a paper that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and so I've just, uh, the, uh, this, this author shared their data. And so I just made some quick maps to show you um, some of the habitat predictions that were coming out of out of the model that they developed. But it's showing you for four different uh, species of the Culex mosquito, the mosquito that transmits West Nile virus, um, what their, their kind of uh, the probability of presence for those mosquitoes. And so you can see how, how different it is. That's the, the reason I put this slide in, how different it is for these different species. And these species do have different behaviors and preferences too. So it's really important to understand the vectors uh, really intimately. And that's what the division that, uh, that um, Dr. Beard is gonna be talking from is, is, uh, is really focused on. Um, and so it's really interesting just to kind of see how different it can be. On the next slide, you will see uh, an example of an, another kind of product that we can use for prediction. So before we were looking at mosquitoes uh, and, and in this system, which uh, at least was operational for quite a while, I'm not sure if it still is, but uh, South Dakota, which is one of those places you remember from the previous map, um, had a really high incidence of West Nile virus, has an operational West Nile virus prediction system. And so you can see here that they're predicting um, the proportion of counties that would test that would have positive um, cases of West Nile virus, and so predictions like this can be can be developed using environmental and other information, uh, and they can be used as a form of early warning for when people should be putting in place um, additional protections, um, public health messaging, um, vector control where possible to get ahead of uh, some of the the potential outbreak that could exist. On the next slide. <clears throat> You can see uh, some examples of other products that are that are possible um, using environmental information and um, disease information and, and whatnot. So there are a lot of different things that we could predict that are informative for people who are trying to protect others from uh, vector-borne disease. So you could have environmental suitability indices. You could have entomological predictions like the species maps I was showing earlier epidemiological information. This picture is actually, I think for influenza, it's coming from one of CDC's uh, forecasting challenges that they run, which are really fun projects. Um, and then on the right, uh, just another example of um, transmission potential that could be mapped from, that was a project that was funded by NOAA and, and others um, <clears throat> that was uh, looking at suitability for a number of 80s born uh, vector borne diseases. And so 80s, 80s are the mosquitoes that transmit a lot of other diseases um, like, like Zika. Um, on the next slide, you will see just kind of how we bring this all together. So uh, we're really looking at kind of bringing together on the right, the uh, observations and forecasts and, and uh, things like that from NOAA, as well as surveillance, uh, health, public health surveillance from um, CDC to develop uh, predictions like you see in the center. So you've seen this before already from the previous slide uh, to inform uh, the kind of user engagement that we have and the decisions that we can make to protect people from, uh, from vector-borne disease. So really driving home this point at this point. Uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, just an example of why this is so important. So making it very concrete, uh, just a hypothetical epidemic curve on the top is showing you that, you know, you typically we respond uh, to epidemics by detecting cases from surveillance detecting that there, there's more than we would have expected and then responding and, and beginning to take action to uh, prevent further spread of, of whatever diseases uh, it is that we're trying to, to prevent. But the idea in the lower pane is that if we have early warning from uh, kind of prediction systems that can give us a, a, an indication that we may be uh, in for a worse year than usual, we can take actions earlier and that ideally would suppress the curve, uh, flatten the curve as we all got used to saying during COVID times um, and that's that's what we're we're all trying to do, right? 
Um, on the next slide, you can just see I have a couple of examples of how NOAA supports uh, prediction products like this. So one, we have we have tons of environmental data, as you would expect, satellites, model outputs, um, in, in situ observations in terms of like terrestrial climate monitoring stations, as well as buoys in the ocean, which are really important for informing our our overall picture of uh, weather modeling, climate modeling. Uh, so these these essential elements all come together, and all that data is of course freely and openly available, so that people can use it in their health modeling as well. On the next slide some examples of some, some modeling activities we've undertaken. So you've seen some of these maps already too, but NOAA collaborates really closely with CDC and other partners. Uh, we have a, a joint postdoc, for example, um, and, and we're interested in developing systems like this. Uh, you can even see the, the work being done on malaria in the upper left corner. So uh, really invested in, in this partnership and trying to get, uh, get some advanced disease prediction models going. Um, moving forward, uh, we also work very closely with international partners, the World Meteorological Organization, the World Health Organization, and the State Department on uh, systems like this as well. So the, the last few slides are just kind of providing some resources as I close things out. Um, Climate Services for Health is a really good document. Uh, this is another one I wanted to share. It's actually a little bit more heat related, but it connects to infectious disease. So when the pandemic started, the Global Heat Health Information Network, which was mentioned earlier in my introduction, gin.org, you can just search for that. Um, provided some information about managing heat risk during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we were looking at the intersection of infectious disease and heat and what people might be experiencing in the summer uh, as they were trying to stay safe from extreme heat while also staying safe from COVID. So that's a good resource and there's more on gin.org. And on the next slide, this is my last slide, I believe, and it's just showing you a, a good resource to end on, which is the HHS Climate and Health Outlook for October. So the um, uh, the HHS Office of Climate Change and Health Equity puts this out every month. It takes uh, climate and environmental data from NOAA and it contextualizes it in the health context. And you can see there's a really good uh, piece on heat related illness increasing among veterans in the, the current edition. So I encourage you to check that out. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Hunter, for that, that great uh, introduction. And our next speaker is gonna be Ben Beard. Uh, ben has had a long and distinguished career with CDC. Um, he is currently the Deputy Director of the CDC Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, Co-Chair of CDC's Climate and Health Task Force, CDC's representative on HHS's uh, uh, Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. He was the Deputy Incident Manager for CDC's Zika virus outbreak response a few years ago. Uh, he's the editor and lead author for the Climate Change and Human Health Group uh, report of the uh, U.S. Global Change Research Program um, entitled The Impacts of Climate Change on Human Health and uh, an author currently on the Human Health Chapter of U.S. Uh, GCRP's fifth National Climate Assessment. Um, he was also a, a champion uh, wrestler back in the day, and uh, he's trying to wrestle with infectious and vector-borne disease for the last 30 years. Ben, please uh, please take it away. Thanks, Bob. Don't know where that came from, the little piece on uh, wrestling. I, <laughs> I almost forgot that myself, but <laughs> anyway, time's, time's passed. So thanks, Bob, and also thanks, uh, Ariel, for inviting me to be here today. And as you can see, I'll be talking about the impacts of climate change and infectious diseases. And uh, Hunter provided a really excellent uh, background for what I'll be talking about. So next slide. So when we talk about um, climate system and infectious diseases, we're really talking about zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that can be spread from animals to humans vector-borne diseases, which are, are transmitted to humans through the bites of uh, carriers or vectors, such as mosquitoes, ticks, or fleas. And um, here in the continental U U.S., for all intents and purposes, all of our vector-borne diseases are also zoonoses. So these are like uh, West Nile virus, uh, Lyme disease, uh, Rocky Mountain spider fever, and so forth and so on. There are a few globally vector-borne diseases that are not zoonoses, but the ones here in the U.S. primarily are. Waterborne diseases, uh, foodborne diseases in the soil, and dust-associated diseases to finish out the list. Next slide. 
So um, in terms of climate change, I like to look at it through a one health lens. And so um, the, the basic, uh, the basis for this really is that climate change strongly influences the distribution and occurrence of environmentally sensitive diseases. So changes in climate lead to changes in the environment, which result in changes in the ecology of the incidence and the distribution of these types of diseases. Next slide. So um, in terms of what, what we've observed uh, uh, related to climate change here in the United States, so observations and trends moving forward, you know, we're seeing longer and warmer summers, shorter and milder winters, an increase in the frequency of severe and unpredicted weather events, uh, such as storms, heat waves, droughts. We're seeing a lot of regional variation, which you can see in this slide that really looks at changes, or this image that looks at changes in uh, frost uh, days across the U.S. And, uh, and then finally, a huge influence on global weather patterns like El Nino and La Nina and uh, these and other types of patterns. Next slide. Um, so just to give you just a little bit of data on that, this slide is a little bit overwhelming, but it's really pretty simple. It's looking at the northeastern part uh, quadrant of the United States at recorded weather over the last 100 years. And the dots that you see in the maps you can uh, really are just weather stations. And uh, it's divided in three different regions, the uh, western region, the central region, and the eastern region. And so the um, graphs that you see are really looking at five different weather measures. They're looking at snow cover. They're looking at bare ground days. They're looking at frost days ice days and extreme cold days. And I'll just point out the overall trends in each of these that you can see from these different weather stations uh, that in general, we've seen a decrease in snow days. We've seen an increase in bare ground days. Uh, we've seen a decrease in frost days, um, a decrease in ice days, and also a decrease in extreme cold days. In some cases, it's slight. And if you look certainly around the Great Lake areas, uh, the, the trend is a lot more moderate. But um, but this does spell out a lot of climate um, changes in climate, weather, and um, and then also the impact that you can foresee that that would have on environmental change in general. Next slide. So to tie that, um, to kind of look at a, a parallel way at trends in vector-borne diseases, this is really over the last 20 years. But um, over the last 20 years or so, we've seen more than 900,000 cases of vector-borne diseases that have been reported uh, to CDC in the U.S. The number of annual reported cases approximately doubled over this period of time from 2004 to 2022. Uh, the reported cases substantially underestimates the actual disease occurrence. And uh, that's what the image of the uh, of the uh, of the iceberg uh, captures on the panel here, um, because reported diseases are kind of like a range a rain gauge. There's a huge amount of underreporting that occurs, and so if you actually look at insurance databases uh, and look at the numbers, for example, of Lyme disease cases that are diagnosed and treated annually, uh, it's a it's a, almost it's approaching half a million cases per year. Uh, and, and of that, you know, only about 30 or 40,000 cases are actually reported to us. Uh, that, that's um, a topic, a discussion for another day, but that's the way reporting works. Tick-borne diseases now account for over 80% of all reported uh, vector-borne disease cases, and local outbreaks of imported vector-borne diseases are occurring more frequently. Next slide. So, um, and just to call attention to one of these vector-borne disease outbreaks with, that was completely obscured uh, because it happened during COVID, but, but in um, 2021, we saw the largest outbreak ever, uh, local outbreak ever of uh, West Nile virus that occurred in uh, the Phoenix, uh, Arizona area, Maricopa County. And so uh, there were, um, over 2,900 2, total cases, 277 deaths were reported. 60% approximately of these uh, occurred in Arizona. And, um, you know, we're in the process. We've been working in, with, with NOAA together to look at some of these issues. But, you know, certainly a wetter than average monsoonal season, it likely can uh, interact with other factors contribute to this outbreak. Next slide. 
Um, to say a little bit about Lyme, um, and this is Lyme disease, but it's also pretty much true for the, all the other tick-borne diseases that are cured by Exodia scapularis, the black-legged tick. Um, this is just showing a couple of snapshots. Uh, what we saw in terms of the case distribution of Lyme disease in 2001 versus what we're seeing, what we saw in 2019. And um, there are a lot of caveats to this, but basically you can see a huge expansion in the numbers of reported cases across this region. Uh, I don't mean to slight um, our colleagues on the western part of the United States, but this is uh, just where we see Lyme disease. Uh, cases, 95% of which are reported in this region. And you can see there's a strong correlation here uh, with um, what we saw in those changes in, in um, weather trends um, uh, uh, that I showed earlier. Next slide. Uh, this looks at the actual geographic distribution of Exodia scapularis uh, based on uh, collected uh, tick collection data in 1996 to 2022. And you can just see that more and more and more counties are showing red for the um, established populations of this vector, which carries Lyme disease, but it also transmits anaplasmosis, babesiosis, Poisson virus, encephalitis, and um, some other uh, pathogens as well. Next slide. So um, kind of winding down vector-borne disease trends moving forward, the factors that drive vector-borne disease emergence really are complex. And I didn't have a chance to go into that, but there's been a huge amount of environmental change, uh, growth in suburban areas, uh, reforestation, expansion of uh, deer populations, all of these things are working together, not just climate change. Uh, Americans, though, because of all these reasons, are at increasing risk for vector-borne diseases. The current trends will likely persist and even worsen in the absence of, um, of effective prevention tools and implementation capacity. And it really remains uncertain how much of the vector-borne disease can, trends, can, trends can be attributed to climate change versus uh, these other factors that I mentioned. Next slide. So I um, just want to mention a little bit about CDC priorities. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Department of Health and uh, Human Services, with the, with the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, uh, leading national efforts in the completion of, of a uh, vector-borne disease national public health strategy that approximately 17 different uh, federal departments and agencies are involved in, such as NOAA. But some of the uh, conclusions of this or some of the goals of, of this or objectives of the national strategy include uh, expanding human and ecological surveillance, including modeling and forecasting, identifying and validating effective prevention and control strategies with, with a keen um, awareness and focus on health equity issues. Uh, developing, maintaining the capacity to local capacity to detect, diagnose, and respond to emerging disease threats, and then conducting outreach um, to the public at risk and clinical providers to increase the awareness of uh, changing disease patterns. Next slide. And then, so in conclusion, um, Environmental change is altering the distribution of disease vectors and reservoirs and pathogens that transmit larger numbers of people uh, uh, over expanding regions for longer periods of time are being exposed. Uh, healthcare providers need to be aware of uh, how these patterns are changing and then also how to uh, diagnose, treat, and prevent vector-borne diseases. And so I have a number of resources in the remaining slides uh, that CDC provides that will can help you in this area. But I think um, in light of time, I'll uh, conclude on that slide. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, we look forward during discussion maybe to, to talk a little bit more about the implementation of the vector borne disease strategy that you've been working on with HHS. And our next speaker is Deliana Del Garcia, Chief Program Officer, International Emerging Issues at the Migrant Clinicians Network. Del began her, her career in health as, a, as an audiologist and has dedicated more than 30 years to the health and wellness and needs of migrant and other underserved uh, migrant populations. She's worked in the areas of reproductive health, sexual and intimate partner violence, access to primary care, 
and I guess most notably for this session, infectious disease control and prevention. She's responsible for the development and expansion of health network and international bridge case management and patient navigation system to make available across international borders the health records of migrants diagnosed with infectious and chronic diseases. Dell, we look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Please, please go ahead. Thank you so much. If you'll go ahead and forward to the next slide. Um, you know, when I was listening to the prior presentations, it occurred to me that some of what I'm going to describe touches on it and, and calls it into uh, play with my presentation. So I hope it doesn't feel duplicative for you. Uh, but I really do want to look at, you know, sort of the impacts of, and methods of addressing infectious and vector borne diseases in underserved communities, principally with the health centers in mind, as they are really one of the main sources of health care for our communities. Next slide. <clears throat> and so beginning with a case study, you have a 35-year-old Hispanic male who presents to the health center with shortness of breath, fatigue, and rapid heartbeat. And so, you know, if you want to take a, a moment in the, in the chat, what else would you want to know? Or what would you be thinking immediately when this gentleman presents to you and you, you see what he is declaring are his concerns? And, uh, you know, what is most likely going to be your diagnosis? Just looking at that. And I think when you look at shortness of breath, fatigue, rapid heartbeat, you know, then someone might consider hypertension, do they have diabetes? And, and what happens in many of these cases is that it's certainly not an infectious disease that comes to mind. Next slide. And so, you know, going on from that, understanding more that he's, you know, 35 year old Spanish speaking male from Honduras, and he comes to your office with those symptoms. And he and his pregnant wife are there together, um, and they've just arrived from South Florida. So then a number of things start to come to play because, you know, the man is from Honduras, certainly, but he's presenting with these particular uh, symptoms. And so, again, you may focus on hypertension and other. But then, you know, it, we've been worried so much recently when we talk about vector-borne and mosquito-borne, and you have a pregnant wife, and they've been in South Florida. Oh, my goodness. Your, your attention may get turned to Zika for example. Next slide. <clears throat> and I think what's interesting is when you look at mosquito-borne, and then certainly the number of things that you may want to consider, because very likely someone from Honduras could have had that exposure, and coming in through Florida, also been exposed to like West Nile, as we were just describing. You know, you look at dengue, you look at chikungunya, you look at malaria even, and West Nile virus. Um, but if you'll go on to the next slide, please. Because also, you know, when you think about those particular illnesses, the symptoms that you are most likely to see, right, are all of the, the flu-like symptoms. They have a headache, they have a fever. <clears throat> Several will have, you know, sort of nausea and vomiting. One of the things that's likely to be perhaps a telltale if it's West Nile is that they might present with, you know, neck stiffness. And that might not have been something that you find somewhere else, but then muscle ache, generalized muscle ache. Um, you know, several of them come with rashes. And so the, the whole issue becomes when you start considering symptoms, how many patients walk through a health center door saying they have flu-like symptoms, they have body ache, they may have developed a rash, um, you know, chills on and off. And so where does the mind go when what you're doing is looking at an entire panel of patients, 26, 29 patients in a day, everyone is presenting with these kinds of symptoms. It's a change in season. There are so many things to think about, about the patient in front of you. And so there's really then, I think, an important need to contemplate your patient population as a whole, and then very specific segments of it um, that are likely to come and when there start being to be changes, major changes in your patient population. Next slide. <clears throat> and so I was asked today to speak particularly about Chagas. And that was something that was already raised by one of the previous speakers um, because it's, you know, it's caused by this little bug. And I think if any of you have traveled to Central America or South America and have ever asked anyone, oh, have you ever been bitten by a chincha? And the chincha is very typical, you know, and everybody goes, oh yeah, you know, when I was a kid, we were bitten all the time and they would come out at night and crawl over us and bite us. And I think that there is so much to be known 
about a disease that is now starting to be present in the United States because the bug is present in the Southern US and we're starting to have domestic transmission. But certainly for so many of us in health centers, what we're going to be seeing is an immigrant population, uh, principally from the Northern Triangle, although now more and more from Venezuela and elsewhere. And so this is yet then something else that we may not have considered previously that we need to take, start thinking about and take a hard look at now. Next slide. <clears throat> because you know it's endemic in, in 21 Latin American countries. And when you look at that deep orange panel, then you know it's all of South America, it's Central America, it's rising into Mexico. And now we're starting to see it move into, as I said, the North America and the US um, in those Southern states. And so as we start to consider our populations and those individuals who are coming to the health center, certainly it is those people who come, who were born and lived in those regions, but we also need to consider anyone who's traveled to these regions, right? And they've gone for ecotourism and they've been living out in the bush and you know they may have been uh, doing some hiking and camping and some other things that expose them very differently than they might if they were in downtown Rio Janeiro and they were staying at a hotel. Next slide, please. And so I think it's important to contemplate the lessons we've learned over time from a number of vector-borne diseases, of infectious disease, conversations that we try to have that really then you've got to make sure that the person who's doing this investigation is really focused on a clinical history, a comprehensive clinical history with the linguistic capacity to know that there are colloquialisms that need to be used, like I was saying, chinche and, and other words, when describing where someone might have been exposed and to what they might have been exposed. And understanding that, you know, it's it's not wholly, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a disease of poverty. It's just that there are a lot of people who also have go camping and they are staying in Palapa, you know, huts and they have mud walls and the chinche is present there as well. You can find it in, you know, here in Texas over at AM. They have a big group that is studying the kissing bug and they can be found in hiding in the walls in that area near the university. So it's really having a sense for the person in front of you and how it is that you would take a truly comprehensive clinical history that's valuable as a diagnostic tool. Because many people, what they do is they look at their form and it has the standard questions and what we've found as we've done a lot of research over the years is that if the question is on the form, it's going to get asked, but it may not be elaborated and it may not be probed. And it really may not get you to anywhere that you want to look if you're trying to think about something that has a greater length of time for concern as far as health is concerned. And so, you know, I think what we need and we need to turn to and create good partnerships with is a, you know, having a robust relationship between our primary care centers and our public health systems, because we really do need to very often be able to turn to the public health sector, <clears throat> excuse me, to help us to try and do the testing that is not frequently available in health centers uh, where you know so much of infectious disease has always been the purview of the government, federal government at the CDC level and state government at the health department level, and even locally at the local health departments, a lot of STD services, for example, STI, you know, the, the um, sexually transmitted infections are dealt with as a part of a public health process. And so a good relationship or robust relationship between primary care and public health, I think has faded and really needs to be reestablished. And each of us should consider our participation in that kind of a relationship in our own communities. As the world becomes much smaller, you have millions of individuals who are migrating. They are, you know, we can say that they are migrating to come and be farm workers, construction workers, and, you know, the uh, oh, hotel industry, all manner of things. But you also have people who are in the computer industries and they're coming back and forth. And we don't consider that much in terms of migration but it is movement. And so we really need to think about not only where the person lives and declares that they live now, but where they have been and where they frequently return to and what it might imply then for their current state of health. Next slide. And it's that whole issue of globalization. 
you know, and very frequently globalization, when we think about it and we read about it in the news, it is really the economics of it, you know, the movement of goods and services, but the movement of human beings and the gentleman who, who spoke, you know, two speakers before who was talking about human migration. And that's really the huge piece of it is the speed with which people can migrate now is really quite incredible. And the distances that they can move and that they continue to move, even if they've come to one spot as they move on, really does mean that any infectious disease present in some part of the world can appear in that individual somewhere else where it really is not a general point of consideration. Next slide. And I think, you know, we're, it's staggering to consider the number of individuals who are migrating. And when we look at international migration, and the most recent data that I could find was from 2020, is that it's, you know, 248 million individuals are living outside of their country of origin. And a huge percentage of those in the United States. But if we just think about that group of people, it would constitute the fifth largest country in the world. And so just behind you know, Brazil, the United States and China, it is the world of migration that is the largest country and constitutes this incredible population of individuals who are really moving great distances um, all the time. Next slide. <clears throat> And, you know, it, and it really varies. I mean, even, you know, we worry a great deal about those individuals who are involved in trafficking and involuntary movement, but those who move voluntarily too can have the same exposures. Uh, those people come in the state of shock because it's unanticipated, you know, the climate change warfare, uh, all sorts of, you know, drug violence, whatever is making them move in an unanticipated fashion. But even those individuals who come with a real thought about where they've been, where they have to go, their purpose for moving, uh, they too have these kinds of exposures that we need to consider. But unfortunately, too much of the conversation about human migration gets stuck in the question of regular versus unofficial migration. Regular because they've come with the benefit of a visa through some kind of international compact versus those individuals who've taken upon themselves to move across international borders for their own purposes and through their own motivations, but without the benefit of that same international compact. Next slide. And the reason this is so, you know, really critical in infectious disease control is, as I was saying, infectious disease has generally been a responsibility of government. Um, at, at the federal and state and local levels. And so if the state system that is trying to encourage people to come to services so that they can receive care and so that we can really then be active in some kind of response and control of infectious disease is the same government that's trying to capture people and deport them um, because that is the goal of that element of the government. It's really very difficult to convince people for whom this may be a concern, that they need to step forward into the light and participate in any kind of healthcare services and take advantage of every effort that might be made to interdict any of these illnesses because they are so concerned about the other element of the government that is trying to stamp, you know, stop their flow of movement. Next slide. <clears throat> And so all of us, as we're looking at groups that we're working with, can think about our patient populations differently. You know, we have the geographically stable patients, the person who lives in Iowa, and, you know, now they are not going anywhere. They've never traveled anywhere. That's certainly a different level of concern. You might want to consider West Nile, right, because of climate change. And then you have your mobile patients. But in that group of mobile patients, it's not only those who have immigrated or migrated from another region of the world, but those people who are big travelers and what it is that they might be exposed to. Next slide. And so I won't spend much time on this because this was already covered in some ways previously. So let's go on to the next slide where we talk about the fact that exposure to Chagas then can really vary depending on the stage in the acute where there is more of an opportunity to have an effect versus where it becomes chronic and where then the results uh, can only be slowed potentially rather than stopped completely is a major concern in healthcare. And the reason that we bring these things up is because you can also have children um, or individuals who are coming to you for whom 
you know, the illness is not, not beyond, way beyond the acute phase, but still may be at a moment where action could be taken. Next slide. And certainly a critical concern is because um, you can have transmission from mother to, to baby. And when you start looking at the ability to then have an effect on an unborn child where you can assist the mother with her health as well, so that we don't have the, the congenital transmission, I think it's really important to understand and to contemplate it when you look at the mother in front of you, where it is that she may have been coming from. Next slide. I just wanna run through this very quickly and it'll be my last comment to you all. This is just to say to you, there was a health center in Boston where a, a pediatric uh, infectious disease specialist saw a, a presentation on Chagas, went back and asked clinicians to voluntarily query their uh, Central American patients. And so the patients were voluntarily asked to submit to a blood test. They went through all of this. They did some education around it. They were able to identify more than 100 individuals who were positive for Chagas and who are currently in care but they've done this by reaching about 14,000 individuals, which very small percentage, but to find that kind of a population in a patient group, I think is critical. And so it does really then raise the, the specter of needing to have different kinds of interventions. Next slide. Just a, a resource for you, next slide. And then questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, thank you. We had we have a quiet group, so I will let Bob um, navigate this with me. But I just want to, yeah, we have a few resources on the slide in addition to all the linked resources, um, and it includes some information from the initiative that Dell just mentioned um, from the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. I did put a question in the chat for the group because we're so quiet right now. My guess is that you're sitting with a lot of information um, and there could be more that you still need to process. But I'm curious for those who kind of indicated that either you're not prepared to address uh, infectious and vector-borne diseases or it's not a top priority for you currently, kind of what are you thinking as, um, as you're hearing all of this data, all of these considerations? Does anyone wanna have any quick chat box responses? Oh, we have a request for Deliana's email. I'm sure if, if um, she feels comfortable with that, we can put that in the chat um, and we can follow up with any points of contact when we send the slides as well. Um, we have, okay, concerned that my organization does not pay more attention to this. Yeah, I know we had a lot of folks indicate leadership buy-in in some of our earlier questions. So there could be something there is seeing the importance, but needing folks to be on the same page, or what is the Ariel, first? Can I throw in something as a concrete step? Because Bob and I had talked about it before yeah. we started. I think if health centers go back and look at their intake forms and really concentrate on where they might be able to tweak some of it, because as I said, if it's on the form, it will get asked, but it may not be probed. And so where someone is living, where someone has traveled to, even if they're a really stable, geographically stable patient, where they've come from, what they've worked in, um, you know, have they spent time in the out of doors? Those are all things. And then also to have some internal conversations about beyond flu-like symptoms, what is it that we need to consider based on our patient population? Because your stats are all there in terms of who's coming from where, what was their country of origin, age now, all of those things that would give you a chance then to contemplate a different set of activities should they become and Ariel, I, I just want to jump in real quick and, and ask um, uh, the panel real quick. Um, a lot of discussion about the fact that uh, these diseases are on the rise and increasing and so on and so forth. And we all work with different populations, some of them rural, some of them urban, some of them suburban and so on and so forth. I think, you know, we're talking about, you know, diseases, I think maybe maybe West Nile and maybe Lyme disease in particular, people think is more of a suburban or rural disease. But I'm just wondering, you know, has there any been any efforts to really address these in an urban setting? And from Ben, uh, relative to the strategy, the national strategy on vector-borne disease working group, I'm wondering 
you know, when when is that going to be available? And I guess what are the next steps on implementation? Yeah, um, thanks, Bob. Um, so in terms of the vector-borne disease national strategy, it's been through the final clearance stages here through multiple federal agencies, and um, it should be made public in November or December. So very, very soon, before the, certainly before the end of the year. Uh, but we're just tying up all the loose ends on that. And and actually, uh, parallel to that, the national, the fifth national climate assessment. Uh, also should should be um, out publicly uh, in the next um, in the next month, November, December as well. And there's a, a large health chapter in there and is a huge uh, and, and, and significant part of that focuses on health equity issues and concerns. So I, I think that will be a really nice, um, a nice um a uh, re uh, resource for people. Uh, specifically about your questions versus urban and rural diseases, Lyme disease in many ways is, is a bit more of uh, the risk factors really are being outdoors. Uh, a lot of people get it in their backyards. We know that through uh, analysis of the surveillance data. Uh, it's very much a, an emerging suburban disease. West Nile virus, interestingly, the most cases are reported uh, from, from urban areas, which, which makes sense because there's more people there. But the incidence, which is the rate per 100,000 people, is actually much higher in rural areas. And I think Hunter showed one of our incident maps for West Nile virus. And you can see that V through the middle section of the country really defines the highest incidence in areas uh, for West Nile virus. And many of those are, are much more rural areas that don't have access to care. So I would say for us, um, that's uh, rural communities actually are very significant um, um, under-resourced uh, populations in terms of uh, uh, access to health care. So there are huge numbers of, of health equity issues here. And, and just to all of you, I'm just wondering, you know, is, is, screen, is screening, um, you know, adequate currently for these vector-borne diseases? And I'm wondering, is there, you know, a strategy out there or a protocol out there for enhancing the screening, you know, relative to these, to these diseases, just to make sure they're caught, and or uh, any formal, you know, process or uh, program for preventing these diseases in the first place. I would think that a protocol that looks at uh, pregnant women who have uh, origins from Northern Triangle countries would be just a really important first step for us to consider, particularly if we have a large prenatal population. Um, as we start to look at those women, and as I said, to try and, and interrupt congenital transmission, then I think that that is an, a, a much more easily implemented uh, strategy that can take hold and a much more easy, a, a much easier protocol. To I can make a couple of really quick comments on work that we've done in that area and published. Uh, the first is looking at dengue on, on the Mexico-Texas border. And uh, one of the elements there that was uh, really screamed at us through the, stat, through the results uh, were looking at the incidents, the differences in uh, case incidents across the border. And much of that was associated specifically with housing conditions and with screens and uh, or the absence thereof on the south side of the border. So that's a very significant issue. Also in Puerto Rico, you know, with a lot of the storms that we've seen there, the hurricanes and the impacts on housing, uh, the rate of dengue uh, previously with Zika and chikungunya outbreaks that we've had there, um, you know, the, the issue of screens on houses is really important. And so one of the studies that we're doing right now, one of the interventions is actually focused on um, developing uh, in, deployable screens to put on windows. It's complicated because they have an impact on airflow and other issues like that. But screens are certainly um, a very important part of uh, vector-borne disease prevention. Over. And I'll just really quickly add from, a, from an environmental and uh, climate data standpoint that linking the climate and environmental data with health data in space and time is a is a big challenge. Um, health data can be uh, challenging to access, and for good reasons. And um, just you know, being able to do studies where you bring those data sets together—that's it, it. Sounds like a very dry challenge, but it's still something that, that a lot of people struggle with. 
And relative to the surveillance piece, is 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 that kind of surveillance trickling down to the local communities and you know, like you know, health centers who serve thirty million you know folks nationally? I think it's really hard with the health centers because so much of this work is most effectively done by the health department. That was what I was mm -hmm. talking about. For there need to be a robust relationship between primary care and public health. And that if you have a good relationship with your public health department locally, and you can talk to them about what you consider to be concerns for your patient population, I think that they would be happy to help you design what an intervention might need to be. Great. 